Good morning. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach had his first book of Preludes and Fugues, the first part of the Great 48, published in 1722. Um, the next part, 20 years later, in 1724. Uh, as a musician, when we look back at the compositions of Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, um, when you get a copy of the original music for keyboard, as I say, the Bach Great 48 is a prime example, in modern publications for piano, you will find dynamics marked in on the music. But these are editorial suggestions. Because when Bach wrote his Great 48, he did so on an instrument that could not produce dynamics. The full title of the piano when it was invented in 1709 in Florence by Bartholomew Cristofori was the grand harpsichord that could play piano a forte, soft and loud. It was a breakthrough. But of course it was many years before the piano took over from the harpsichord as the popular instrument. Indeed, even a hundred years later, some composers were writing books of music for both the harpsichord and the pianoforte. Um, so therefore, as I say, when you see um, dynamics marked in a piece of music by Bach for keyboard, one has to realise that in the original music, there were no dynamics in that music because the instrument cannot produce dynamic contrast. And so as a performer, you have to think what would sound best. And everybody has their own opinion. And it's not as if it's like a, like a science, like a mathematic, that that bar should be louder and that bar should, should be softer. There is no right or wrong. There is no 100% and 0%. You do not get it right, as I say, or wrong. There are simply contrasts of opinion. Um, <clears throat> what is important, of course, is that if you have the ability with a piano to make dynamic contrast, it greatly enhances the performance. But if one was playing on a harpsichord, in fact, with you, when you often get modern keyboards, electronic keyboards, they have a particularly good harpsichord sound, and when you play on the harpsichord, there is no dynamic contrast because harpsichords, harpsichords cannot produce dynamic contrast. As I say, there's no right and wrong. It's not like two plus two makes four. There, you know, there is no right. Or, there is no degrees of right or wrong about that answer. You know, it's not partially correct correct to say that two plus two make four, or partially wrong to say that two and two make four. But when it comes to dynamics, as I say, it's it's a matter of personal taste. What's important is that they're in there, but there is nobody is going to say to say. That, that it was wrong to have made that bar louder than, say, the previous one. Okay, history lesson done with, I hope. Um, I've just finished what uh, listening for the second time the new series of podcasts by um, Law Drizzen. Law and I Rider and Steve Drizzen. Sorry, I'm full of these little, little, uh, little slips for you to catch me on. Um, Yes, just finished watching the new podcast, listening to the new podcast by Steve Drizzen and Laura Nyroda. The first episode is called Origins. I will include the link below. It was very, very good. I particularly liked the fact that they refer to the Marty Tancliffe case at about the 10 minute mark. They don't mention Marty Tancliffe, but it's quite clear who they are referring to. And Marty Tancliffe was, of course, one of the 204 so one of the 125 uh, false confessions in the uh, Drizzin and Leo um, article, uh, the story of false confessions in the post-DNA world, um, a, a look at 125 false confessions. Um, and I'll say, I'll, I listened to it. Um, it did still leave me with some questions. Um, and as I say, I've covered Scarlatti and Handel and Bach. And as I say, 
in uh, 2004, Drizzen and Leo wrote their book, their article, 125 False Confessions in the Post-DNA World. And um, having had recent correspondence from uh, Richard Leo, he informed me that uh, Steve and him are going to get together and do a, an even bigger um, article looking at 250 cases. One hopes that because this is going to be sometime in the future, Brendan Dassey will be one of those featured in the 250 cases. And you know, having contacted, obviously, um, Steve Drizzen regularly, um, but also um, Richard Leo and Saul Kassan, um, I've done my own sort of um, analysis of the, um, the various false confession scenarios um, and how um, people were exonerated. And number one, I've, I've, put, I've put at number one, false confession without coercion. Um, strange as it may sound, there have actually been false confessions without any coercion whatsoever. And of course, Henry Lee Lucas is a prime example of that. There was no coercion <laughs> on, on him. He just quite happily blurted out the biggest load of nonsense anybody had ever heard, and yet some in law enforcement were quite happy to go along with that. Hmm. Next, I would put category number two. Um, a coerced confession, yes, but exonerated by the victim being found alive and well. <laughs> yes, that, uh, that, that's an interesting case. In fact, I believe that going way, way back to the very first, one of the very first documented cases of somebody about to be executed, the person he was alleged to have killed and that he had admitted to, to killing was actually found alive. Hmm. Not that I, that, that, I can't imagine there are too many of those. Now, number three scenario, um, exonerated by the fact that the accused could not have been the perpetrator. Def despite giving a confession to say that they did the crime, they could not have been there, uh, that they were elsewhere. In, in some cases, they were locked up in jail. Again, Henry Lou Lucas, a good example. There are times when he could not have been where he admitted to being. Um, Scenario number four, the one I particularly like, is identify the real perpetrator. The Kathleen Zellner technique, as I would call it. You know, let's just cut to the chase on this. If you've got somebody that's wrongfully convicted for whatever reason, just, just put some effort into finding out who it was that did the actual crime. It goes a long way in helping to get your client out. Um, obviously, we've got example number six, exonerated by DNA evidence. DNA evidence, yes, it can be problematic. It can exonerate people. It can also wrongfully convict people. But obviously, since, since its inception in 1992, there have been thousands of people exonerated, many, many, that have given false confessions. Scenario number six, um, as I refer to as my holy grail, exonerated purely by the science of false confession. I believe, and I've, I've yet to come across anybody who can say otherwise, that um, Brendan would have been the first in 2016, had Brad Schimmel had just accepted the fact that Brendan has, is completely innocent and hadn't pursued it. Then I, I, I've yet to come across any other case before Brendan in 2016 that would have been. Um, for me, of course, um, I was interested in the Hugh Burton case. He was exonerated in 2019. And I put it to Saul Kassan that this was, as, as highlighted in this, um, this article that I read about it, um, that this was, as I say, my holy grail. However, um, 
I'll reread it because it's interesting, this paragraph from Saul Kassan. He wrote, I don't know if it's fair to say that Burton's was the first ever exoneration based solely on the science. What did happen in that case is that the DA's office, having considered all the evidence, maintained that Burton was guilty on the confession until we met and spoke and they read the relevant science. The Burton case was astonishing in many ways that are common, including the fact that the likely actual perpetrator was known to the police before Burton was convicted on the basis of his confession. And so therefore, we're, we're in effect, we're going back, aren't we, to uh, number four, that um, being exonerated by finding the actual perpetrator. Um, as you know, I've also, as I say, been in touch with other people, including Richard Leo, asking about whether the um, videotaping of, conf of interrogations has been helpful. Um, it appears that probably it has. Um, more and more states are adopting the use of video, making videoing of interrogations uh, mandatory. Um, and as some of you know, I've had a little bit of contact with um, WBAY reporter Emily Matasic, and she directed me to some videos that she had done, one of, one of which was, was very interesting. Um, it's from the 26th of September 2017, and the audio quality isn't great, but if you go to Emily Matasic's uh, Facebook page, um, I'm afraid I can't share the link, nothing seems to work. Um, and I'm not that technically minded, but if you go to her Facebook page, you can have a listen. Unfortunately, the quality of the recording is particularly low. There's a lot of noise inside the building, um, and the, obviously the microphone isn't particularly close up. But one of the, as I say, she's interviewed, interviewing Jerry Butin, and obviously the date is significant because that's the day of the um, <laughs> a, the the Armbank hearing, the. Um, the, the, the fiasco of uh, Hamilton and Kahn and Easterbrook and Sykes. And he points out, and I think this is very important, interrogators should not lie. He points out that in the rest of the English-speaking world, lying has been banned. Only in America can interrogators lie to the people they are interviewing. And yet, of course, during the Armbank hearing, what do we hear Khan say? He says, can they bluff? Laura replies, yes, they can bluff. I find that, as I say, problematic. Um, Although, let's first of all consider what is the difference between a bluff and a lie. Lying, as we all know, is a sin in accordance with its gravity, seriousness and its impact. There are moral laws against lying. Bluffing is lying plus cheating. For me, they're basically the same. Of course they are. But I find it interesting that Jerry is pointing out that no, they should not lie, bluff. And yet, unfortunately, Laura, you told Khan, yes, they can bluff. So my first question would be, and it has been for many for a long time now, is Brendan still in prison because any of the judges that he's been before think that he's guilty. Well, we know for a fact that Seth Raxman has pointed out that not a single judge, not a single judge that Brendan has come before thinks that Brendan is guilty. So why is he still locked up? I think the answer was given to us very eloquently by Kathleen Zellner in Making a Murderer. It's political. 
It's political to help support the conviction of Stephen Avery. So let's get back to our Renaissance composers. Now that we can add dynamic contrast to our pieces, there is not a right way or a wrong way of adding dynamic contrast. It's an art. Music is an art. It relies on that contrast um, for us to use. So my next question would be, is there a right or a wrong way to go about getting Steve and Brendan out? Sorry, full of questions. Another question. Is it maybe time to, to hashtag work with Kathleen Zellner? And to help expose the fact that Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are being held as political prisoners? I've been to obviously various presentations by Stephen Laura and quite rightly they've pointed out that when Stephen Avery is released that helps Brendan Dassey of course it does but in the podcast would it have been too difficult to have pointed out that both Steve and Brendan Brendan are innocent you know that they're innocent you know perfectly well that they're both innocent so why not shout it out from the rooftops please have a think about it bye for now